Let me acknowledge very briefly, I didn't realize that we would have such a formal event uh, for such an uh, informal activity as handing over some helmets. But I see very good representation. Uh, firstly, the mayor, the ministers who spoke, the councillors from the municipality, a very strong detachment from the JCF. I feel very secure here. And of course, all the residents uh, and uh, uh, bikers who are here. It is great to be in the parish of St. Anne, and it is um, always good to be in the constituency of Northeast St. Anne. In 2022, I had announced in my budget presentation that the government of Jamaica would secure 10,000 helmets to provide to bikers freely. This was an initiative to ensure that as we enforce the new Road Traffic Act, that the requirement for bikers to have helmets, that they would not run afoul of the law because they were unable to afford helmets. 10,000 helmets may not be enough. However, 10,000 helmets are significant relative to the problem. When we were refining the Road Traffic Act, the new Road Traffic Act, and we were examining the emerging problem of motorcycle debts, debts caused by crashes from motorcycles. We decided that the definition of a bike shouldn't be just the two wheels and the engine. No. The helmet must be a part of the definition of a motorbike. So if you're going to sell a motorbike, you must also be selling the helmet with it. If you're going to ride the motorbike, you must be riding the motorbike with the helmet. You can't be riding the motorbike with one wheel. Some of people are very skilled like that. But you should consider that if you're going to ride the bike, an important part of the bike is the helmet. And that is what we wanted to convey to riders, that in the same way as the wheels are important part of the bike, so too is the helmet. And therefore, the government thought that it would be a reasonable thing to do with taxpayers' resources to purchase these helmets and make them freely available. There are those who may say that, you know, it's, it's a waste of taxpayers' money to buy these helmets. People who are riding bikes, those who choose to ride bikes, they should buy their own helmets. There is merit in that argument. But I want you to consider for a moment the cost to you, the taxpayer, of having to treat someone who ends up, because of no fault of your own, carelessness on their part, but when they turn up at the casualty and the a and at the hospital, we can't turn them back. It might have been your son. We have to treat them. The cost of treating them is a thousand times greater when you put all those accidents together than the cost of buying these helmets and giving it freely to them. I wish to make the point that the statistics around the wearing of helmets suggest that you have a close to 70% chance 
of avoiding serious injury if you wear a helmet while riding and you are involved in a crash. You have an almost 50% chance, greater chance that is, of surviving in a serious crash. So this is a very good investment to me in saving lives and saving the resources of the state. Because it is not just the cost of treating the careless bike rider. When that bike rider occupies a bed, and he probably would have to occupy that bed for several weeks to recover, think about the other persons who would be deprived of that bed and that doctor's attention. So for the government of Jamaica, it is not simply a matter of changing the law and writing the ticket for the careless rider. What the public sees oftentimes and is very critical of is the government's attempt at enforcing the law, but they are not always seeing the government's attempt at trying to help people to comply with the law. So yes, we have increased enforcement without question, and we are making the necessary changes in employing new technologies in detecting breaches of the law and in the administration of the ticketing system, which is day by day becoming more efficient. And I wish to congratulate the police on the effectiveness of their administration of the ticketing system. I saw a very interesting post on social media where a driver, I don't know if he was, uh, well, I, let me not speculate, but he was making the point that he, he stood a better chance with the older police than with the younger policemen. I don't know if you, if you saw that one. But it was a very profound statement because what he was insinuating, though not saying it directly, is that there is a change in culture in the police force as it relates to enforcement. So Jamaica is going through a change, without question. And you will never have change without some people feeling that they are going to be worse off because of the change. Regardless of how bad a system is, there are some people who always benefit from it. They, they, they have found a way to survive under a bad system. And as you change the system, they feel that they can no longer survive. So you're, you're in this kind of invidious position where you're, you're, you're putting in a good system and people feel they can't survive under a good system. Essentially, that's, you know, that's the summary of, of where we are. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't improve our systems. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't get better at enforcement. But we understand the social dynamics. We do. And I, I'm not going to go too much into this business, Minister Vaz. I leave you to, to deal with those issues. But for the, our drivers, our bike riders, our taxi men, who are saying, listen, we earn our bread off the road. And this is Jamaica. They don't provide proper place for us to pick up and set down our passengers. So we have to hustle. We have to break the law in order to survive. Because the way the law is set, it's not set for our survival. That culture, that mentality, we understand. But that is not going to build the Jamaica that we want. At some point in time, every one of us 
Whether we drive taxi or we ride bike or we push handcuff, we are going to have to say, when will Jamaica become an orderly place? But it's not just an orderly place that we want. We also want Jamaica to be a fear place. Fearness. Because when you go behind the conversation about stronger laws and greater enforcement, the arguments that you get back when we meet with the taxi bed, when we hear the bike riders, when we hear the people in the market, they want to be treated with respect and they want to be treated fairly. When I sit at my desk listening to all the issues and looking at the laws, yes, I am always going to try to increase enforcement, but I'm always looking at, is this law fair? We don't always get it right as lawmakers, but when we listen to feedback, we begin to understand what we need to do to make the law more equitable, fairer, and just. So yes, it is an imperfect system, but we are working to make it better. So part of getting equity and fairness in the law is that as we enforce the law, and we understand some of the issues that the people who we are enforcing the law on, they face, we try to support and assist. So as I'm talking about motorcycles now, the motorcyclists complain to me, when I see some of them, I know a few of them, they say, boss, why? We understand the safety issue with the helmet, you know. But it's hot, man. You ever ride in a Jamaica, and it's, just, it's hot. And so they, they raise that issue of the discomfort in wearing the helmet. And these are people with degrees, you know. These are people who, are, who understand. But they are making a decision that, boy, they believe their skill is going to be enough to keep them safe, even though they understand that the helmet gives them a 70% chance of surviving in an accident. So we are dealing with a culture, yes, that reduces safety relative to comfort. Not putting into the calculation that if there is an accident, it is not only your life that is going to be at risk, but you're going to cost the country significantly for your health care. So the government has to take an approach of public education, which we are doing, of providing options for helmets that are comfortable to wear. So the helmets that we are providing, I would say that these should be more accessible and more comfortable to wear, but still give you good protection. And then there are those who feel that wearing helmet is not macho, is not masculine to wear a helmet. They actually believe that. And then there are those who say, yeah man, me, I believe in wearing the helmet. But we're not going far. Very interesting piece of statistics we discovered at the National Road Safety Council. That most of the accidents, I keep saying accidents, they are not accidents. They are crashes. Accidents are unpreventable. These crashes that resulted in deaths, they are not accidents. They could have been prevented if they had helmets. But most of the crashes that take place, which have resulted in death, they have occurred within one or two miles of where the journey originated. It's not any far distance, close to home. Oh, I better go shop, drag on my slippers, drag on my shorts, jump on the bike, make two dolly, end up in a truck back. We have seen so many of those. It's the reality. 
So it's not a long distance journey only that would require the helmet. Anytime you're going out on your bike, just as you look at the two wheels to know that the bike can move, your helmet must be there before you move that bike. That's the new culture we want. So I close by saying a few, a few months ago, Minister Vaz, I'm coming in on the toll. And all of a sudden, on the toll road, you know, and you know the toll road here can be dark at certain parts. All of a sudden, I see some lights coming behind. So I said to my driver, is, is, is what that? Is another motorcade that? And when we look through the window, I saw mad me see a skate on the toll. No helmet. Zoops, zoops, zoops. Roll me. And I hold down my head and I said, God, carry them home safely. Carry them home safely, God. Because them don't have no care about their life. My job is to care about their life. And at that time, it never makes sense. I even said, make we ride them down and stop them. Because that is more problem. I could only pray that they get home safely. It is not masculine. It is not macho. It is not strong and brave. It is stupid to ride without a helmet. Somebody has to tell them that. And we have to help them to understand that they are putting themselves and their families at risk. So, today, we have procured 2,000 helmets so far under the Live Good budget. And uh, we have in procurement another 9,000 helmets. Some of that is going to be paid for by the increases that we have seen based upon the revenues that have come in from the enforcement of the fines and fees. So we are using the increase in revenues from enforcement to put it back into your safety. So it's not just to punish you and take money from you. We are investing it back into your own safety. So we have 2,000 that we have started to distribute. We are doing 200 here. But all around the island, we are going to give them out. One method of giving out these um, helmets is that as you come to renew your registration or you're registering anew, we will provide you with a helmet. That is how much the government cares about you, even if you don't care about yourself. And we will be launching a very intensive, as we have been doing, we have been working with the various bikers associations and we have been going around the country trying to encourage bikers. But I continuously see these youngsters riding without helmet and they, they think it looks fashionable, you know, it looks macho and brave. No, it looks stupid. I close by saying, uh, I believe two years ago, I went to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Rwanda. This is a country in Africa. And I was so very impressed. If you think Jamaica has a bike culture, no, Jamaica's bike culture can compare to Rwanda. Everybody there almost, including bike taxis. And everybody rides with a helmet. I did not see one biker without a helmet. And they all rode with the greatest discipline and respect for the road code. Why we can't do it? Them not different than we. Why we can't do it? At some point, you know, as people have asked ourselves that, why we can't do the discipline things? 
that we have to put police over you every minute to be giving you a ticket. The same energy, you know, it takes to stop at the stoplight. In fact, it takes more energy to try and beat it. So a lot of it comes down to our culture, what we choose to do as a people. We are in this constant struggle, back and forth, trying to get order, but at the same time, trying to be equitable and just. It's a constant struggle. But governments have to be definitive in the direction that they're going. Meaning, we have to set the law in a democratic process. We have to put in place the systems to enforce it. We have to listen to the people relative to the feedback of the challenges that they have. And we have to help the people to comply with the law. And that's our comprehensive approach that we are taking. Not just to make our economy better, but to make our people and our law and public order better. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for listening. And I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that by this effort, we will save some lives. God bless you and thank you.